Hey, good morning and welcome to the next keynote at Birmingham Tech Week and I'm delighted to be joined by the wonderful Jill Palmer who is the CEO of Birmingham's very own scale-up story, Click Travel. Um, and Jill's going to talk to us about secret and lies. Very intriguing. <laughs> the, truth, the truth about fast-growing startups. Um, and of course, the week is proudly supported by NatWest and the rest of our sponsors in association with Tech Nation, the growth company, and the Department of International Trade. So Jill, without further ado, I'm going to kind of let you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit more about you, um, but also Click Travel as well. So I'm Jill Palmer. I'm the CEO of Click Travel. I've been at Click Travel since 2012 and Click is a tech company in business travel. So we support hundreds of customers from FTSE 100s to public sector and third sector organisations book all their travel in one place on our travel platform which we developed in-house with our wonderful software engineers particularly important these days is being able to book in a covid safe and secure way so we've done lots of work with our customers to support them with that and then also most importantly cost effectively and get all your reporting and dashboards in one place so that's us wonderful and um what, what was it like when you kind of joined click travel um you know you, you obviously kind of went through this kind of massive growth period what what underpinned that well clicks grown spectacularly i mean when i joined it was a 30 million pound business turnover business and it's now 300 million turnover it had 40 staff and last year we had 250 staff so um in significant growth but when i joined um it was you know doubling its turnover every year so in effect it was very hot um and uh, and and spectacularly successful but in a way really a victim of its own success um things were just starting to run out of control of it and the founders were very astute in understanding that they needed somebody to in the business to really support with the operation and i joined as operations director um, and it, the first sort of six months was very interesting. We, we actually lost two key customers in that first period, which I think was showed that things had sort of slid, slightly started to slide. Since then, we haven't lost anything. Um, and it was really a question of getting hold of the key things that were, you know, needed to be to be to be done, which was, you know, leadership, technology, customers and the target market. But a couple of anecdotes, really. I mean, the telephone system um, just was on its knees um, and it used to break down. Uh, regularly. I mean, I think the only time I've actually cried at work was when it broke down twice in a, in a week. And I used to say, you know, we are a call centre, like the clues in the title, customers have to be able to get hold of us. And we were dealing with customers like Whitbread and Talk Talk. All of these people are still our customers, by the way. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, we just weren't able to provide them with a service. So it was getting hold of those things. They used to come and knock on the door and, and somebody would go, oh, Jill. And I'd say, what is it now? And they'd say, well, they've come to cut the electricity off because we haven't paid the bill um so it was it was basics really um but everybody was running around uh trying to do the right thing um and just trying to keep the wheels on a spectacularly successful business well, that's, that's that's interesting isn't it kind of how kind of everyone's doing everything with the right intentions mm. of course things are just kind of going so fast it's hard to hard to keep control um, yeah. so talk to me a little bit more about how you built the right culture then and and more importantly, I guess, some of the, the lessons you've learned along the way. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I, I mean, I think the culture was incredible from the start. So this wasn't about changing the culture or at all. It was about harnessing it. So we had an amazing culture and, and the, the key thing is to keep that whilst you grow. So it's very easy to have a great culture when you're 40 people and you're all in the same room. It's very much more difficult when you're 200 people and you're dispersed and working virtually. Um, I think the important thing towards that is to find the leaders of tomorrow, really. Make sure that you have the right leadership team in place. And we did a huge amount of work with the leadership team, developing our leaders. We put all our leaders through um, a, a consistent management leadership development uh, course called Leadership Essentials. Every leader goes through the same thing in order to really understand how we work around here, what are the important things, what's important to the business, and also really shouting out when things go right, but also when people are not exhibiting those key behaviours 
that we want to, them to exhibit, then they're not right for the organisation and taking those difficult decisions as well. It doesn't really matter, you know, you can be the best performer in terms of your, your area, but if you're not leading in the right way, then, then you're not good for click. Yeah, it's, it's, we, we touched on that a little bit yesterday um, and I gave the example of I worked along, alongside someone and she put herself forward for a um, managerial leader role and what was interesting is she'd never kind of shown any kind of managerial leadership skills um, within the organization itself. Um, and if we'd have taken it at face value, then that person would have never become the fantastic leader that she did become. Yeah. And what was interesting is over a coffee, we found out that she um, actually was man managing a team of 100 people at a charity in a spare time. Oh, that's um, amazing. It's great, isn't it? And I think that's yeah. that, isn't it? It's kind of really kind of getting close to your people and finding out what makes them tick, you know, not just in work, but outside of work as well and how you can kind of take some of those softer transferable skills as well, right? I have to say that this is one of the things that I enjoy doing most in an organisation. I remember when I was at Mercedes-Benz, I used to work at Mercedes-Benz and I used to run their customer services operations in the UK. We had a very junior person working in the contact centre there and I just spotted that she had potential and I developed her and mentored her. And eventually she ended up being a team leader in the, in the contact centre. But what she really wanted to do was be an after sales field manager. So going out to um, dealerships and talking to people about their stock and their service and their warranties and everything else. This had never been done by a woman in Mercedes-Benz before. Um, it was hilarious. We, we mentored her. We coached her to go to the assessment centre. She got there. Uh, it was hilarious. They phoned me up afterwards, the, the, the senior directors who had interviewed her, and they said, we've got a bit of a problem here. Um, we've interviewed everybody for this assessment centre, and Emma was the best person. Um, so they'd interviewed like 10 men and Emma, and, they, and we said, well, I think you should give her the job then, don't you? And so effectively, she became the first um, senior after sales director and uh, lead, um, field person at Mercedes-Benz and went on to have a stunning career there. And I absolutely, I love that more than anything else is finding those gems in the organization that are sometimes hidden and that have these amazing skills and developing them. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it's always the ones that, that you least expect, right? And, and I think yeah. often people that, that are somewhat introverted as well, yes. who don't necessarily kind of shout the loudest, but yes. kind of quietly going away about their business. So yeah. yeah. I think that's so important we identify those people yeah. um, and, and you talk about kind of identifying the, the skills gaps and um, so once you've kind of identified a skill gap you've identified someone that can plug that gap yeah. what kind of training do you put in place to make sure that they then you know are developing those right skills because of course in a, in a fast-paced world of technology things are constantly yeah. changing, so we, we almost need to be lifelong learners Absolutely. No, I totally agree. And I think there is a, an absolute culture of developing um, development within CLIC. Um, the, from, a, from a management perspective, our consistent leadership development program, which includes mentoring, is very, very important for that. But then we also have little things that we do within each organisation. Everybody has a personal development plan and making sure that you do that. But we have a key KPI within engineering, actually, which is that we want our system and platform to be so simple and we want to support people so much that a new engineer, we want to be able to um, develop, um, test and deploy a, a useful piece of code, um, useful for customers or internal customers within a week of them joining. So every engineer that comes to our organization gets that challenge from day one, which I think really helps them to feel, you know, right, I'm underway here. I'm, I'm off the starting blocks and I'm doing useful work really very quickly. 100%. And, and two, two things that I'm finding through, through the conversations from, from this week, but also kind of, you know, myself being part of kind of a, a scale up is, it's about people and culture, you know, yeah. that's, that's, that's key. We've got to get that right. But also more and more, it's the technology that underpins that organization. It's organizations yeah. that take that digital first approach. Um, yeah. It's not about digital transformation. It's about digital first. And um, so how did kind of, and, and you, you gave that story at the start about, you know, about telephone system going down twice in one day and, and it being horrendous day. Yeah. Um, 
what have you done to kind of you know build that technology stack and and create something that really kind of supports the business and and again delivers an effortless customer experience yeah so i mean i think there's a couple of things um can i make one point before we go on to that which is about celebrating success which i think is absolutely fundamental to culture and i will put this slide up although it is not a covid secure slide uh, as you can see and in fact it, it speaks to technology because we did a big technology migration at click we migrated from a very monolithic architecture into a domain driven architecture and we migrated all our customers from one to the other and i'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute but this this picture at the top with the arrow is the party we had in the office when we finally migrated all our customers and i just think that it is so important for an organization as they grow and perhaps they're growing so fast and they're focusing on what's going wrong that you forget to sort of take a step back and really enjoy those moments so i'm sorry i really just had to include that slide because that's one of my favorite slides that i include when i'm talking about click it, it makes me it makes me miss that that kind of thing. <laughs> oh. Look at this and go, oh no, when are we going to be able to do these things again? It's so much part of life, isn't it? Enjoying your colleagues and being able to, to work collaboratively in that way, face to face. It's, a, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. Yeah, I, I, those, I, times, those times will come again. They so, will, they will, they will. It's, um, I, I, re I remember kind of we, we hit our um, yearly target and um, the, the founder and CEO of the company um, flew us over to Vegas for, for four days and it was just kind of you know one of those memories I mean we, we went all around the world in, in the end um, but actually that was important because it, it did allow us to kind of step back and celebrate together um, and of course we, we failed together as well that's that's equally as important to fail together but yeah, yeah again kind of great great pictures to represent the, the culture of click there. No incredible so would you like me to talk a little bit about our architecture? <laughs> okay so i mean one of our core principles is to focus on domain problems so we we want to be solving customers problems and creating new features and, and and getting them out to people as fast as we can we do not want to be managing the server you know updating the database these kinds of things so i mean when we started out we had an architecture and a, a, a setup just like everybody else that included a couple of servers in in a room but this was you know back in 2005 um, we very click quickly adopted cloud-based architecture within our, uh, our setup. When Amazon Web Services uh, created their relational database and launched that, we very quickly moved on to it. And it was really interesting at the time. I remember this. This was before my time. I joined in 2012. But in 2012, when our sales team were trying to sell Click, and they'd say, tell us about your architecture. And they'd say, oh, we're, we're based in, in the cloud in AWS. And customers just go, oh, not sure about that. And, and one of the ways we used to sell it was used to say, well, Netflix do it. So, you know, if, ne if it's good enough for Netflix, it's good enough for us. But, you know, now if, if somebody asks, you know, tell us about your system architecture and you say, oh, we're based in AWS, it's like, oh, big tick. You know, so it's over that time, it's really, really changed. But even at that point, we were not happy with the speed with which our developers were, engineer, were engineering things. They were, it was, we had a big monolithic architecture. It was difficult to change things. And our customers were not meeting that KPI. Our, our, our engineers were not meeting that key KPI of getting some new features out within a week. Uh, so we had a really good think about how we were going to organize things. And the engineers settled on domain-driven design and event-driven architecture. And that's how we work now. Please, if you have a question afterwards, do not ask me about domain driven design. It is not my area of expertise, but I'm really pleased to say that one of our senior engineers, James Butherway, is running a community event on this during Birmingham Tech Week. So get yourselves down there to learn much more about the exciting stuff we do on that. We now have over 60 different domains within our architecture and um, it enables our, our engineers to develop stuff really, fa really fast and in isolation so they can pick things up and put things down they can work on really cool stuff a lot of the stuff that birmingham tech week are talking about you know api step function serverless zero con configuration scale up we do all this um at scale uh, in production so it's a very exciting way to work it also has helped us during the travel with the, the pandemic when business travel has you know slowed down significantly because it's enabled us to scale down and we scaled 80% of our overheads on, on AWS just with the touch of a button. 
Uh, so the ability to scale up and scale down quickly has really helped us. And we are, we really do consider ourselves, and we're very, very proud to be at the bleeding edge of what we do. Um, we've worked on a, a new way of distributing airline content with BA, uh, and we were the first people in the world to develop that. Um, which uh, had a real knock-on, significant knock-on effect for our customers because it was cheaper for them to buy flights, was basically what they saw. But what our engineers were working on was something really pioneering. Um, and, it, it, you know, BA wouldn't be, um, it wouldn't be, um, it, would, it would admit that we were both learning at this point. You know, their engineers were learning from us and our engineers were learning from them. And I think that's what really fires up and excites engineers is being able to do that new exciting stuff. Does that, does that answer your question? Have I answered your question? I haven't mentioned the telephone system yet. That's a whole nother story. Our okay. telephone system is now in AWS as well. So we use AWS tele telephony. I think that's it. That's, um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll leave that for another webinar. But um, I, no, I think it's great to see that you've put so much thought into your architecture and that kind of AWS is underpinning it, but you've got so many kind of different domains and systems actually powering different functions of a business. And that's the point about this slide. The, the orange bit is the bit that the engineers work on. All the other complexity is outsourced. So they really get to work on the fun stuff. And, and I think your point around, and I think this is something that scale-ups often miss out, and it's the ability to scale down as quickly as you've scaled up. Yeah. Oh, totally. You scale yeah. in the wrong way. You've got all these things, and you might be you might be growing really fast and, and, yeah. and really profitable, um, but all of a sudden something blindsides you, and you are at a loss like how to unpick everything. And um, yeah. I think having kind of it, it built in this way is is kind of really integral. And also great to kind of hear that, that James is kind of taking part. And I know that James actually isn't the only kind of clicker that that is taking part in in, in Tech Week. And um, no. really kind of good to see that balance of you know, this is all about the organization and how the organization is scaled up and put tech at the heart and people at the heart. But actually, then it's drilling down and, and kind of going to those finer details. As yeah, well. absolutely. I mean, one of our one of our engineers, Ruth Mills, is doing a talk about how she has um, is collecting data from her drain pipe in her house in Sheffield and then, um, you know, publishing that to, um, you know, data sh sharing databases to, um, you know, support the environmental aspects. That's so fascinating and just such an interesting thing. And that's what that's what you have done so well, Yanis, with Birmingham Tech Week. It's just having this ecosystem of people who are just talking all about this amazing stuff. It's, it's really brilliant. Oh, thank you. That, that, that means a lot. And, and I think kind of testament to the, the kind of culture at, at Click that, that everyone's kind of, you know, innovative and thinking about how to kind of change the world and, and make the world a better place. So, yeah, yeah kind of really, really fascinated to, to kind of take, take a look at that talk. Um, you know, obviously, the, the, the architecture itself and the systems, you know, they're, they're designed to obviously make people's lives easier people that work in the organization yeah. but more and more your your customers I'd, and I'd love to know a little bit more about about who your customers are and and your target audience but how that's changed over time as well um from maybe kind of in the early days to where we are now yeah in terms of implementing customers or uh you know or what's what's changed in terms of our customer base yeah i think i think a bit of both really yeah who, yeah. who, who they are um, but yeah. also how you engage them and, and kind of, yeah, everything in between, really. That's a really interesting question. I mean, when we started, we went for everything. So we would, one day we'd be talking about a customer was spending 200 million pounds on a global, in a global way in, on business travel. And the next day we'd be flying our sales team to Glasgow to talk to somebody who spent 100K. And what we realized, we were just spreading ourselves too thin and we needed to be very, very ruthless about our target, target market. And so we got exceptionally good at saying no. And we, we really targeted customers that spend between about 500K and about 10 million on business travel. And that was, that was our, our ruthless. And that has been probably one of the keys to our most extraordinary success. I mean, if we do a bid, we have a 100% bid shortlist rate and our conversion rate is about 40%. So we, you know, we pretty much win. We win an awful lot of what we go for in this market. And then we are able to implement them very quickly. So if a customer, for example, we have a customer now that's just about onboarding with us. 
because their um, existing supplier wants them gone, by, very nice of them, by uh, 25th of November, they will be up running with us with all the databases and everything that they need, all the reporting, all the policy control, COVID secure in that time scale. But the other thing that we've had to do, COVID has really made us think very carefully about streamlining our business model. Um, and, you know, there are some things that we were trying out to see if they would work in the, in which you can afford to do if you're making lots of money, which we were, um, and um, had some marketing budget. But we've had to simplify our business model and go right now everybody's going down the same route. Everybody's doing the same sales process. We're having this consistent implementation. It's all very lean and our engineers have been really able to support that. That's, that's, that's really good and, and kind of I, I'm, I'm always always keen to kind of delve into um, the, the bottom part of that funnel um, yeah. prepared to say no you can say yes no. I, I'm, a, I'm a victim of that um, but but I'm, I'm learning how to say no more because I guess it isn't in line with the vision and what we're trying to achieve um, so yeah, yeah, yeah. How, how do you go about saying no in the right way well, we have some very, we're almost too good at it, Yanis, if I'm honest. We have some very, very clear guidelines about what we will and won't, won't bid for. And for example, when we do a large trade show, I spend as much time coaching the sales team to get people off the stand who aren't appropriate contacts for us than actually, you know, talking to the people who are on the stand. But I, for me, it's about you have to sell with integrity and you actually only want customers who are going to be delighted with you. So that's the way we say no. We say we only really want to work with customers who we know we can absolutely delight. And we think you'd be a wonderful customer, but probably not for us in all honesty. That works wonders because in a few years when things have changed they'll probably remember that and come back but the other point about being rather good at saying no is our sales team are so much in their comfort zone with this type of selling um, I, it's unfair to call it a comfort zone i'd probably call it a kind of smashing it zone really in terms of what they do they are a little bit uneasy about going for something that's a bit more off piste and there's been we this year we won the best large tmc in the industry awards um for uh, uh, at the business travel awards and this has given us a platform to um you know move into far bigger work and win far larger customers but initially the sales team were really quite nervous about that and they would say oh joe you know we're not we're, we're not sure we've got this amazing win rate we've got this amazing bid shortlist rate if we go for something that's a little bit more out there it's about that fail fast fear of failure thing don't be frightened to try something it's just let's try it let's go for it we will learn a lot even if we don't win and we've been winning so you know it's almost it's great because actually as we've won things people go yeah we can do that now and they're getting the real confidence to go for things so i think it's a it's a bit of a double-edged sword that you uh, we've, we've been a victim of our own success there um, in terms of how we define ourselves and now we really want to push the boundaries more which is incredibly exciting how do you push for boundaries? What What is next for, for Click Travel? Well, it's really interesting because COVID's been a tough time, um, a very tough time for the business. Um, but what I wanted to do was make sure that we got that balance right between, you know, focusing on the here now, managing costs, dealing with the things that we've got to deal with, but at the future, having a vision for the future. Because I, I describe this as, you know, we were doing so well. Last year was probably the best year we've ever had. We were We were absolutely flying. We've won every single major industry award. We were, we're sort of climbing up a hill and I could imagine us sort of being really towards the top of a snowy mountain and then an avalanche has come and we're, you know, we're two thirds down towards the bottom again. And the way I describe it to sort of extend the metaphor is there's now an, a, a, a hill to climb again, but it's actually now a different hill because everything has changed and we all have to accept this. We're in a different world now. And it's, it's almost just a little bit misty. You can't really quite see it. You can't really quite see what it is. So you're feeling your way. So we did a lot of work. I did a lot of work with the senior leadership team over the summer to look at our strategic objectives, look at how we were. And we went through all the sort of um, strategic review of the business and really come up with some really key objectives for the future, which we're announcing um, over, the, over the autumn to the business so that everybody's motivated with a key goal for moving forward as well as you know, just managing the day to day. But, but right now that is hard in terms of messaging because there's some hard stuff going on, you know, furlough, JSS, you know, we've had to take some really hard decisions. And 
managing that message in terms of yeah it's all great we're going because we we know we're going to smash it in the future it's just this is a hard time now and managing that message is something that i wrestle with on a daily basis indeed and and kind of customer expectations and needs are constantly shifting and, and yeah you know, right now you know every client and every customer has different needs and expectations how do you how do you get close to your your customers how do you kind of ensure that you are listening to them but not just listening acting upon what they're they're telling you as well got a really good example of this during lockdown um and it's a reason why it's so brilliant to have uh, our, our engineering team so close to us uh, our account managers um you know it, 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 we knew we had to pivot the business to help people with covid security but it was the and we launched a product called clickcare and this was in response to customer demand to um, you know, help people make COVID secure travel choices. And, and you know, I remember the meeting when we decided to do this and it was our operations director who runs all the account managers who said, you know, customers are starting to say to us, when we get back to travel, how will we pick COVID secure hotels on your platform? Because one of the things we do really well is full content. And as a result of that, there are, millions of hotels you can book from a hostel through to the you know five-star hotel on our platform but actually they need more hand-holding than that now and so that was a change to saying it's all here you make your own choices to actually we need to curate something here which is covid secure we were able to launch that in about three weeks we launched the we, we the, the engineers built it we had the website, the, the, the video, the press release, everything. And that is because of the very close collaboration between the account managers who talk to customers all day, every day on the ground, and our engineers and the marketing department really coming together to respond. The other thing that I absolutely love about ClickCare is we've created a, you know, a, a community of travellers to give, the, give us their feedback on how that is going when they're out there traveling. Because with the best will in the world, Yanis, I cannot possibly say whether the Hilton in Basingstoke is COVID secure today, but a traveler who's there can. And so what, what we've done is created a really great feedback loop that goes in using the traveler community to give feedback. And if, if the Hilton in Basingstoke, and I'm not picking on them, I'm sure they're amazing, has a problem today, a traveller gives us that feedback, it will be immediately removed from our COVID secure um, database and only go back when it's met certain standards. So that, uh, it's that real time, you harnessing the power of the community out there to give real time feedback is, is really what it's been about. That's, that's, that's really interesting because kind of, you know, we, we've seen the shift around kind of customer feedback from, you know, surveys to lots of real time feedback. Yeah. But and I, I worked in that industry for for ten years. Oh. But still, nothing beats actually having a real conversation. Yes, with a customer. Yeah, uh, no, I agree with you. I agree with you. And we, I mean, we we have a, an NPS score at uh, Net Promoter Score, uh, which is on the platform. It's pumped into Slack. We haven't talked about Slack today. My favourite tool. Sure, other brands are available, but my absolute favourite collaboration tool is Slack. And everybody in the business sees that real-time feedback from customers. Most of it tens, tens, tens with five-star trust pilot. So, you know, it's, it's going very well. But the occasional one where it's not, we are on the phone, you know, within two hours to that action. And, and most customers are very surprised to hear from us because they've just put something on a, you know, on a feedback form and they never expected to get a call. Um, it's, it's quite amazing the extent to which you know, they, they don't expect to have that real time interaction with us, but we make it happen. That's great. And, and, and I just wanted to kind of um, touch on what you mentioned about cross team collaboration as well. The fact yeah. that your, you know, engineers are talking to your sales and marketing team. Now, someone that's kind of worked with a lot of startups and, and scale ups, that, that is quite a unique thing. Um, there's not a lot of organizations that encourage that cross team collaboration yeah. and actually make it work. How, how have you actually managed to create a culture like that? Taken a lot of time, actually. I mean, when we started, I think there was a real division between the engineers and the rest of the business and a real disconnect between, you know, what the engineers thought they were building 
and thought was right and what the what the customers wanted and the account managers needed and and actually nobody wants to be in that situation i mean engineers just passionately want to they passionately want to build things that's exciting future focus but ultimately has a real impact i think Putting the engineering team, we have three members of our engineering team who are now on our senior lead, in our senior leadership group. Um, and so that, and they all bring a different aspect. You know, we have a, a real technical engineer, we have a product, head of product, and then we have an engineering manager who looks at the culture side. And bringing them all together into that group and having them front and center of everything we do has been incredibly important and in fact when i talk about this strategic um work that we did we've ended up with um four strategic pillars in our organization that we want to work on for the future three of those are being led by engineers um, so they are at the absolute heart and when we look at product vision by the way because we know that we have to look at product vision all the time and be continually you know, scoping and, and looking at the landscape and seeing what's coming up and what we want to do next. That is a team of our head of consisting of our head of marketing, our head of product, our technical engineer, um, and, and the three of them work together with our co-founder. One, uh, you know, the, the co-founder of the business is also heavily involved in that pro product vision. And that's where the, the collaboration really happens because you've really got the real time feedback there in terms of what the customer needs, in terms of what's possible, from the engineering perspective and what the pro and what's what what the future is in terms of the product roadmap and it's certainly something I, i'm seeing kind of that, that's happened since covid is is more collaboration that, that's yes. happening we've been kind of almost forced into it but also kind of something you've got on your slide there which we we talked about just before we went on air was the fact that um it, we're, we're almost building this resilience right we've all we've yeah. all learned to deal with you know some of the most horrendous times yes. um, in, in lots of different ways so um yeah, yeah have you have you seen I, I guess you have seen that right uh, yeah uh, i mean click has been through some really difficult times and uh and so we we already had a muscle memory of dealing with crises and and developing and we've developed over time that collective resilience for how you deal with these things so that has really helped us. And there, you know, in terms of this crisis, terrible as it has been, it has really, really forced us to collaborate. And the team, the, the senior leadership team, the engineering team, they've never been in a better place in terms of, you know, fast iterations, having to respond. I mean, it is amazing. And we've had people who've, you know, had to take on roles and responsibilities completely outside of their normal area. So our sales director currently is working she was furlough furlough woman and then became JSS woman and she is the person who manages that scheme for us our director of engineering has been looking at um, our, the reopening of our office in a COVID secure way you know, really basically a facilities management role and I think just taking people out of their day to day and, and it really felt like almost every day it was there was a new chart task it was like your task should you choose to to accept it your mission should you choose to accept it this week is work out how you're going to respond to you know suppliers who are changing their apis because they they've changed their cancellation terms and now we've got to reprogram something and then you know work out all the cancellations that we've got to deal with uh put in place the furlough scheme manage the three-dimensional chess puzzle of coming off jss going off furlough and onto jss I mean, all these things have just been challenge after challenge after challenge. But I think the senior team, it depends on your mindset. And for me, I've spent a lot of time recently talking to the senior team and saying, you know, are you up for this? Because we have actually gone three quarters of the way down the hill and we are going to have to climb back up it. And I really only want people in the business that are really up for that challenge. And the great thing is they've all responded so positively. But you have to look at how you, you know, retain and motivate people who are right now and having a really tough time uh, because it's tough for everyone but particularly if you're in business travel i mean i think you know it's fair to say we've been one of the hardest hit sectors and the other thing is you, you've got to be able to think about what the future is going to be like you know are people going to travel again how are they going to travel again what does that mean i've been really keen to encourage the idea of traveling mindfully and really thinking about the journeys that you do treating business travel as the really really important precious asset that it is because we all need that human interaction to get our jobs done 
but ultimately accepting that you have to travel safely and also with concern for the environment as well and with the right partners. So all of that together, really, in terms of how the future looks for business travel is the kind of thing that the team are working on collaboratively now. And that, that's exciting, isn't it? Kind of looking, looking towards the future of, of what, what you know, the possibilities are. Yes. Even it might seem daunting. And yeah. I've got a question here from Theo Millwood, who is the CEO of Swimtime. And um, Theo asks, how do you balance, and, and he says, with respect to the crisis, how do you balance medium-term financial survivability with investing in long-term development? Yeah, big challenge, big challenge. I mean, we've been incredibly lucky. We, um, we had a, an investment from BGF uh, two years ago. And since that time, we haven't actually paid a dividend. Um, we've been a very cash generative business um, and we've done that because we wanted to invest in the future but the byproduct of that has enabled us to, to us to have a sort of pile of pile of cash that's enabled us to wait this out I mean the first thing is I would say it's all about the people and our key thing throughout this has been to try and retain our engineering team and keep our engineering team together it would have been very easy and I have to say we were put under a certain amount of pressure not pressure is the wrong word but encouragement for you know a lot of the team to go on furlough and a lot of the team to take pay cuts at the start and for as long as possible we've tried to re you know prevent pay cuts across the business but it particularly protecting our engineering team because we know that those are the people with the um the knowledge and experience to build things for the future and we've kept them working throughout they've been partially furloughed some of the time we paid them throughout um, and they've really appreciated that and been able to therefore build the stuff that we need um, for the future. So our investment is in people. I mean, we, we recruited, we were recruiting engineers throughout, in, you know, during this time as well. Um, our investments in people and the people are the people who develop the infrastructure for us and the technology for us for the future. That's great. Great to hear. Um, and I'm just going to encourage people to kind of start to get your questions ready. Um, so you can use the chat functionality or the Q&A um, to ask Jill any questions that take your fancy. Um, I mean, Jill, kind of, we're, you know, we're very proud of, of having Click Travel as, as one of our success stories in uh -huh. Birmingham. So, kind of, you know, kind of thank you to, to you and the, the rest of the team, but also the, the work you do across the, the community as well. Um, yeah. What, what, why, you know, what has Birmingham got going for it? Um, you know, what, what, what does a region bring to your organisation? Well, we've been in Birmingham for 20 years. Um, so uh, as an organisation, we, we love it. And I went to university here and so did my dad, actually. So we're, a, we're real, real Birmingham fans. I'm a huge fan of the, of, of the region. Um, I love it for a lot of different reasons. And, and we really love supporting the local community here as well. Um, so the work we do locally with, you know, people like Seaford Fireside, we have, um, we have work with the local colleges to support uh, work experience with socially disadvantaged groups and, uh, and just, you know, links with the universities as well. I mean, I think the, the low overheads, um, the central location, which is phenomenal, uh, enabling us to just get anywhere. Uh, it attracts talent. Um, it's got great universities for coding and um, that expertise. The networking, particularly the tech networking, the great work that you do with Birmingham Tech Week is an example of that, but we do AWS meetups, everything is here. Um, and really, you know, the youth of the city, the fact that it's, you know, got this, this really young population. For me, you know, the time is now. I have to say, Anis, uh, you asked me this question or somebody asked me this question on a panel last year and I mentioned that it had a lot of Michelin starred restaurants and our head of marketing said, do not mention the Michelin starred restaurants this time, Jill. Mention the Nando's and the Pizza Expresses and all those other good places that you can go out and eat at. But I'm going to say in terms of eating out, which we can only do with our families at the moment, can't we? It is a phenomenal place that, you know, every, everything you want to do is here. Um, I think the other thing I would say is when we did our BGF investment, uh, we only dealt with advisors who were based in Birmingham. So um, our corporate finance advisory were PwC, our legal advisory were Evershed's, and we used the ecosystem in Birmingham to, um, to, to support our deal. Um, and I loved that. I love the fact that if there's a knotty problem, you can get together over a coffee, 
um, and, uh, and sort it out without having to get on a train down to London. I'm very keen to support local advisors wherever possible. I can't see that everything is in Birmingham. I can't see a reason to need to go elsewhere to get your support and advice. And, and, and I want to encourage that, but I encourage it for a reason, which is because they're all really, really good. You know, BGF in Birmingham, PwC in Birmingham, Evershed's in Birmingham. They've all, they've all helped and supported us along the way. So, and they all know each other as well. So it, 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 it makes things easier if you're working with people where you've got that, got that relationship. Yeah, I, I think that uh, I, I've worked in London kind of a lot of my life and, and you know, London's great, but it, it can feel, come away kind of feel, feeling a bit cold. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you, know, yeah. you, you have to do a lot of kind of talking and, and kind of networking and connecting the dots to find really who to talk to and, and how to engage with people whereas mm-hmm. yeah, you're right I think kind of Birmingham once you have found a, a right partner in a particular area mm-hmm. it's very easy then to get recommendations into other advisors and, and businesses that can support um, mm-hmm. I also think that kind of one of the things I'm particularly proud about kind of Birmingham and West Midlands is our, our diversity as well. Um, we, we kind of heard a stat from, from Tech Nation during our opening event that actually we employ more people from diverse backgrounds in tech than anywhere else in, in the country. Um, and we do, we're doing a lot of initiatives around that. Um, just keen to get your thoughts on the importance of diverse, a diverse workforce. Absolutely. I mean, that that I absolutely love about Birmingham and Solihull, where I live, you know, the diversity of people here. I mean, my, you know, when I compare it to, you know, my friends who go, whose children go to school in other parts of the country and the, the, the lack of diversity there compared to the ecosystem of diversity that there is in Birmingham, which I just think is tremendous. But I think, you know, from a a diversity perspective, this is something that Click takes very seriously. And it's really, I would say sustainability in its widest sense, really, beyond just a green stuff and beyond just ticking a box in the diversity is, is really how we are focusing on this now and looking at the entirety of people that we employ so that we can be as open uh, an employer as we can be. Uh, we do really well. Um, in you know in in certain areas but we can always do better um we have internal working groups now on internal sustainability and external sustainability so not only how we can get better ourselves and with everything we do around the community and employment opportunities and all of that uh, and also you know what how our customers how we can support our customers with this but this this year in the summer we uh, ran a virtual work experience scheme uh, for, um, you know, particularly, to, I mean, it was open to anybody and, and children from uh, Click um, uh, parents came too, but particularly targeting those areas of Birmingham where there is socioeconomic deprivation and going and reaching out to those colleges and saying, you know, come on our, come, you, you might have missed out on a bit of work experience this year, come on our scheme and, uh, and we'll run something. And the great thing about this was, it was all the junior people at Click that put that scheme together. The graduates, um, the the early early people at, at Click in the start of their career, they put that together for this cohort of people, which really brought it to life for them, I think. But it's very hard to reach those groups. That was one thing I did notice when I ran that scheme. Um, reaching out to colleges, you get a, you you get a lot of initial interest, and then people perhaps don't turn up on the day for one reason or another. So if they didn't turn up, we were straight on the phone ringing them up, saying, you know, you're still welcome. Please come along. Um, and the difference between that and when I put it on LinkedIn, and then I had a lot of parents of my contacts saying, oh, can my son, can my son have a place? Can my son have? Which was all fine, but I think the level of support that those people perhaps get more than you know, a, a, a you know, child of a single mother who's working three jobs to keep, to keep things going. And, you know, they're bound to, they're bound to forget about the work experience. My son was booked on the work experience and he forgot and went to Thorpe Park instead. So, <laughs> I mean, what can you do? It's, uh, as, but that was okay because I got him on the next day. But if you, you know, how, how do you do it? So there's a lot more we can do with that stuff. And I'm just so excited to just get back to some kind of new normal where we can get, get, get working on and all this really important stuff. I think that's so true. And, and yeah, one of, I mean, one of our, our partners 
is uh, BMET. Um, so BMET have come on, on board as a sponsor. Oh, brilliant. And, and I think, yeah, their, their kind of whole, I guess, rationale, but, you know, wanting to partner with us was, yeah, how do we reach those kind of, you know, hard to reach areas? How do we make sure that the people that, you know, are from those kind of, you know, social economic backgrounds where they, they haven't got the benefits that, that you know, we, we sometimes almost take for granted, um, you know, how do we give them the, the necessary skills for the future? How do we yeah. not leave them behind? Um, so, yeah, I, I kind of love to get you involved in, in some of that activity. Oh, of, love to be. I mean, we, we got involved with One Million Mentors and a number of our senior people mentor people who are just in, from lower socioeconomic backgrounds wanting to get into the kind of industries we're in. I was so fortunate with my mentee. She was 18. She'd come over from, um, from Pakistan um, sort of five years earlier with no English. Um, she was studying com computer science and her goal was to get to Birmingham University to read computer science and then to become a software engineer. And she said, I want to show people that this can be done. She was amazing. But I was able to introduce her to Click, to introduce her to software engineers. She spent time with them. She, she spent time with the, the team and um, helped her with a CV, how she presented herself, networking, everything. It was so, and you get as much out of it. Well, you probably get more out of it, really. Really. We don't we don't do it for altruistic reasons. We do it because it's great fun and uh, and we love it. It is the, the honestly the energy I get from from mentoring. It's yeah. uh, you know nothing nothing beats it. Uh, no, brilliant, great, and and I kind of see yeah kind of you know it's clear to see what what Click have done across the, the Birmingham tech community. So thank you. I've got a question here from from Luke. Um, what's the hardest thing about scaling? Uh, I would definitely say retaining the culture whilst you're scaling is really hard because uh, it's very easy when everybody's in one room and then when you're, particularly as we've always been virtual, virtual working, but much more than we are, we are now, is keeping that consistent culture alive. And, uh, and I mentioned Slack earlier. Slack is so fundamental to, to how we work and um and you know ensuring people are able to collaborate really easily and uh and then developing the fun side of the business as well when we furloughed people we put people we, we set up a furlough slack channel for those people so that they could continue those conversations and we could communicate with them um and the other thing i set up when we um when we started lockdown was a uh, box set and film suggestions channel which is still we people can come on every day and say oh watch this over the weekend and actually what do you think of that and i think you know keeping your humanity during this time and keeping the personal element of your leadership alive um where as you grow and that consistent um view of of what we are as a business through thick and thin is crucial you talked about kind of retaining culture and consistency with culture. Does culture evolve? I think it has to. And, and I think, um, and it has to be resilient enough to face the evolutions that are happening in a business. Because, you know, it is incredible roller coaster journey that we've been on at Click, including some really big tragedies. But you know, um, throughout, I think there's been a consistency around who we are and what we stand for. But obviously, we have had to be very adaptable. And so what's happened recently has been heartbreaking. Um, and, you know, the business has taken knocks and it never expected to. And I think that is something that when a business grows and grows and grows and it almost seemingly cannot, you couldn't, you couldn't envisage something that was going to cause it to, to have, a, have, a, have a blip. And then to have that and face it and get through it, you're going to be stronger at the end of it. You know that. But it really is, you know, it's something to be worked at. I suppose, you know, you know, it, it's just some, it's like a marriage, really. You have to continue. It's something you have to continually work at and continually accept that you're growing, you're changing. It will evolve, but there's a consistent stri strength to it that, uh, that retains at all time. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think it is, it's, it's fluid, right? Culture should be yeah. kind of taking lots of, of different aspects into it and, and developing. Um, question from Sarah here is, what do you what do you do to keep sane as a as a leader? 
um, of a fast growing tech company? You know, what, what, what do you do to make sure that you're looking after yourself and, and also your, your people as well? Um, and she specifically goes on to kind of say, you know, especially as a, a woman in tech um, and a parent as well. Yeah, I mean, I think I love that phrase, you know, fit your own gas mask before fitting others. You know, um, it, it, it is an oxygen mask before fitting others. It is so important that you take care of yourself because if you can't take care, if you don't take care of yourself, you won't be able to take care of other people. So I think anytime I'm going into a particularly difficult period, as you know, lockdown has been, I, I sort of double down on, try to double down on the stuff that is you know going to keep me well so you know eating properly exercising making sure i take a break you know and and i think getting into a routine you know my routine in lockdown would start in you know i'm i'm very lucky to have a small gym in my house so it would start in the morning in the gym and then it would be a little bit of a look at the press conference whilst i'm finishing work and then a, and then a walk in the evening and i think having those routines and habits is 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 really really you know um important and then i think really it, as a woman you know it can be a lonely job being a ceo can be a lonely job being a, a woman in a senior role is 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 difficult too i think it's about having your having the the mates you can reach out to when things are tough and say you know i'm having a really bad day should we have a chat or should we have a, a catch up whether it's over zoom or whether it's over a coffee and um and just being able to be honest actually about how you're feeling and just and sometimes just appreciate sort of how you are feeling emotionally and what you are therefore bringing to a conversation and being able to rise above that to a certain extent is uh, and really being able to sit back but 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 unfortunately and this isn't healthy nothing really beats a glass of wine at the end of the day does it <laughs> so that too absolutely kind of a, a glass of wine in a, in a good film um, yeah. Actually, just a random question. You talked about film club. What any film recommendations? Not film, but I tell you what, the software engineers have got me into nailed it, which is a completely anarchic baking program on Netflix. They all love it. So I thought I'll give this a go and I got completely hooked. It's hilarious. It's like bake off on drugs. Uh, there's nothing like it. Uh, you either probably it's a Marmite program. You either love it or hate it. But and it's that kind of thing which I love because I think, ah, oh, well, I really would never have tried that. So uh, no, we've been into everything. But there is a mix of genres that, that certainly and a, a wide variety of tastes that come out of the click travel box set fil and film suggestions. <laughs> That's great. I'm definitely going to check that out. Um, it made me laugh. I was on Twitter last night and, and someone said, I've got the iPhone launch and Bake Off at the same time. How the hell am I going to choose? <laughs> do both. Do both at the same time. No, I have to say, I have two boys. So I, my, my, my house, is, I feel like I live in a sports bar. There is some kind of sporting event on my television at all times. And sometimes, you know, we have a television in two rooms and different sporting events on both. So, uh, yeah, sometimes it's hard to get the... Uh, get the time to watch my own programs that's when the ipad comes in absolutely yeah yeah having your kind of yeah multi-device kind of yes. system better. <laughs> and jill just to, just to kind of wrap up um kind of what what would you like to see from from birmingham and, and the west midlands tech community kind of moving forward you know if we kind of fast forward 10 years and and kind of look ahead what would you like it to, to be i think that i'd love it to why does Birmingham never make the news? You know, even in these lockdown, when they talk about lockdowns, they don't mention us. So I would like us to be newsworthy for our tech and really known for it. And, and for the government to really support that. Um, and for there to be more investment in the Birmingham tech community and more ecosystems and more fun coming out of it. Because I think what we're doing here is great. Um, and, but I think, it could be, I could think it could be better. And I think more widely, I would love the government to champion tech and champion particularly UK businesses. We need, now is the time more than anything for the government to make procurement decisions and, 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 and buy British and buy, the, and buy into the amazing tech ecosystem that we do have in Birmingham and, and in the wider, wider world in the, in the UK. I couldn't agree more. I think, I think we need to, as a region, 
shout louder because I think that actually there's some amazing things that are going on businesses people initiatives programs um, and yeah. we just don't do a good enough job in my opinion um of, of telling the world and telling the rest of the UK so yeah, yeah. that's that's something that that I want to kind of spearhead but also you know it's going to take more than just me and, and, and my team it's going to take you know a really collective effort of everyone across the yeah. region so yeah that's kind of my my call to arms off the back of that Jill is, is oh. we can do a better job of that. No we know you can do it and the, and it is extraordinary I mean even the, I'm a, an avid reader and when you look at Birmingham Literature Festival that is a great festival and it is never mentioned in the press when they talk about literature festivals they talk about Cheltenham and Hay and something going on in Manchester and Reading and whatever and it's like well what about Birmingham so I don't get it but I think if, if we could just do more on that that would be superb but I've every confidence in you in you Yanis and what you're doing here it's wonderful we'll change we'll change the the, the narrative yeah <laughs> one, one person asks um a final one um, and we can pick that up afterwards as well kobe asks and um, will the work experience scheme be running again soon um, great idea for our travel and tourism students in these challenging times looking for experience so absolutely drop me a line uh on uh, um, on linkedin uh I really want to run it again. We've, we've effectively, we've done the work now, so we can cookie cut it. Uh, we might do it, even do it at Christmas, but uh, we will take advantage of the, of the holiday periods and definitely invite people along. We, uh, we love the idea of doing more in this space. Wonderful. I'm just going to end with Fiona's comment there. Um, she says, love by British, real opportunity, Birmingham and Broadly really good session and I think she kind of sums up the sentiment of all of us so Bill, thank you ever so much for, for taking your time today to be a part of Birmingham Tech Week oh thank day. you for asking me Yanis I really enjoyed it my pleasure thank you again and yeah, thank you to everyone that's joined us today um, and enjoy the rest of the week bye thank you